There's a new science study that is claiming that networks of observers are responsible for determining physical reality. Determining physical reality, what does that mean? They're basically saying that the observer and collective observers are actually responsible for what we would call space and time. And the proponents and the scientists in this article are actually saying that this could lead us to the understanding of the God equation. Some magical mathematical theorem that basically explains all of what God is, or at least points towards it. I think that's just as presumptuous as saying there's something like a God gene or a God molecule, giving this whole splendor credit to something very, very small within it, rather than the context that it swims in. But... Pretty much what this paper is telling us is exactly what New Agers have been telling us since the dawn of granola, and also this theory predates the written word. Very interesting. So if you're interested in this, smash that like button, do the rest of the dance, and I'll come back at you after this rockin' intro with some more Waking Infinity news. Welcome back to Waking Infinity News. I'm your host, Ben Joseph Stewart. There's a new article out there by Robert Lanza that is basically saying networks of observers like me and you and all people, we are all observers and probably animals in some respect, all hold together space, time, and reality as we know it. But this isn't very, very new. Actually, it predates what we understand as being modern science. If you go back to the originals of Australia, not the aboriginals, these are the original people, they believe that we dreamed reality into existence and we actively still dream it into existence. This is gonna come in handy because today, we really only feel safe believing things that the more modern style of language around science has been propped up. But tribes and chiefdoms, all the way back to the Crusades, really, this was just philosophies that were more tribal and also militaristic. So if you wanna dive deeply into this article to see what science is saying about this, let's dive into what Big Think has covered in their article. Robert Lanza was a stem cell and regenerative medicine expert famous for the theory of biocentrism, which argues that consciousness is the driving force for the existence of the universe. He believes that the physical world that we perceive is not something that's separate from us, but rather created by our minds as we observe it. According to his biocentric view, space and time are a byproduct, not a pre-existing thing, but a byproduct of the whirl of information in our head that is weaved together by our mind into a coherent experience. His new paper, co-authored by Dmitry Podolsky and Andrei Barvinsky, theorists in quantum gravity and quantum cosmology, show how observers influence the structure of our reality. According to Lanza and his colleagues, observers can dramatically affect the behavior of the observable quantities, both at microscopic and massive spatio-temporal scales. In fact, a profound shift in our ordinary, everyday worldview is necessary, wrote Lanza in an interview with Big Think. The world is not something that is formed outside of us, simply existing on its own. Observers ultimately define the structure of physical reality itself. Collective Evolution also picked up this article and spoke about it, showing that this idea isn't altogether new. Think back to Tesla. No, not the company that Elon Musk surreptitiously took over. I'm talking about the guy, Nikola Tesla. Think back to what he said in a book called Man's Greatest Achievement in 1907. He said, all perceptible matter comes from a primary substance or tenuity beyond conception. Filling all space, the akasha or luminiferous ether, which is acted upon by the life-giving prana or creative force, calling into existence in never-ending cycles, all things and phenomena. Now, if you would have told me many years ago that Nikola Tesla would be using words like akasha, luminiferous ether, and even prana, I would have lit some sage and called in the four directions years ago. Because you see, this is a guy that modern scientists, they go back and they love, but they hate New Agers. And I'm, I'm definitely making blanket statements here. But what I'm saying is, 
We typically think of these concepts now as new because science dependent thinkers, think of that term, a science dependent thinker. I can't think outside or I refuse to think outside of the bounds of scientific rigor. I get it. I understand it because science today is really putting it into a new language that we understand differently than those old new age philosophies or all the way back to Buddhism and Hinduism and Taoism and these things that are relatively talking about the same things just in an older, more arcane language that's harder to understand by our very rigid materialistic and sometimes reductionist thinking. So. Now, thanks to this paper, we have newer language to wrap around the very same phenomena. And thank goodness, because science-dependent thinkers are loving the fact that they can believe the same things that the New Agers believed, but they don't have to actually be New Age anymore. Because consider, this is what a New Age person would say about the creation of reality. I'd like to see a positive LSD story. Would that be newsworthy? Just once? Today, a young man on acid realized that all matter is merely energy condensed to a slower vibration, that we are all one consciousness experiencing itself subjectively. There's no such thing as death. Life is only a dream, and you're the imagination of yourselves. Here's Tom with the weather. <laughs> and now, science-dependent thinkers who always need, before they believe anything, they need to see it on paper or on a screen rather than a cannabis-assisted stoner rant, can now use this article to back up their theories. As Lanza explains, observers like you and me and anyone else live in a quantum gravitational universe, a quantum gravitational universe, and come up with a globally agreed upon cognitive model of reality by exchanging information about the properties of space-time. For once you measure something, Lanza writes, the wave of probability to measure the same value of the already probed physical quantity becomes localized, or it simply collapses. So here are my thoughts. Once somebody measures something, puts a specific metric onto a form of reality, then all different types of similar quantities underneath that will start to fall into the place of the measurement, meaning that collapses the probability of the wave function all the way down into a particle to where it's manifested reality. It's not potential anymore. It's here. It's real. This is super interesting because now I wonder how many people have actually been paying attention to morphic resonance, the work of Rupert Sheldrake, or have read Science Set Free, because he's been talking about this very same thing for years and years, all the way back to when Terence McKenna was alive. In the book Science Set Free, Sheldrake says, Animals of an inbred strain are placed under conditions in which they learn to respond to a given stimulus in a characteristic way. They are then made to repeat this pattern of behavior many times. Ex hypothesi, the new behavioral field will be reinforced by morphic resonance. Skipping down a little bit, therefore, in an experiment of this type, it should be possible to observe a progressive increase in the rate of learning, not only in animals descended from the trained ancestors, but also in genetically similar animals descended from untrained ancestors. That's morphic resonance. That's putting something learned into the field and other similar genetic or let's just say similar phenomena in reality because we are part of creation. So we have also believed ourselves into creation. Other rats that don't come from the same family line learn the same thing that this other family learned. That's morphic resonance. The original experiment was started by William McDougall at Harvard in 1920 meaning we've had this science for some time now. So the wrong gangway, which is a path for a rat to go down, was brightly illuminated, while the right gangway was not illuminated. If the rat left by the illuminated gangway, it received an electrical shock. The two gangways were illuminated alternately, one on one occasion, the other on the next occasion. The number of errors made by a rat before it learned to leave the tank by the non-illuminated gangway gave a measure of its rate of learning. Some of its rats required as many as 330 immersions involving approximately half that number of shocks before they learnt 
to avoid the bright gangway. The process of learning was in all cases one which suddenly reached a critical point. What that means is once a trait was really learned within one rat, it made it easier for that family and for all other genetically similar rats to learn the same thing. We've been looking at this at Harvard since 1920, and now we're just coming up with different language and different papers to wrap around it so we can regurgitate what's not news but olds. So here's what I think is remarkable about this. If you were to have a story repeating over and over and over again throughout the entire population, even if it's just a made-up story, and everybody doesn't have to believe it, it's just a large enough amount of the population believes this one story strongly enough, does it start becoming true? Like if there was a mainstream media, I don't know, frenzy about something happening on the planet right now, and everyone is talking about it, and let's say more than 50-60% of the people even truly believe in it, even though it's completely made up, then does it start becoming more real? Do we start holding it together somehow in the fabric of reality? You gotta wonder whether this article from Robert Lanza is actually showing us that we as a collective are creating reality based upon what we believe. And Rupert Sheldrake has been talking about this for quite some time. I say that because, well, maybe that's actually happening and maybe that's the power of news. It's the narrative. If you get people believing something, you actually hold that framework in reality and you create space-time reality out of that and the narrative produces a reality. Hmm, makes you wonder, what's going on all over the news right now? And I can't think of it. But I'm not even going to get into dark matter and how Russell Brand has been basically showing that uh, a lot of Einstein's theories potentially wrong. And the idea of what dark matter is, is actually the quantum vacuum. Not even going to get into that. That's over at the Deeper Dive. That's what I'll get into in the Deeper Dive. So go over to benjosephstewart.com, become a member, get access to all my Deeper Dives, the things that I really can't and sometimes just don't say on YouTube. Get involved in the Discord chat. And I just want to say, if you've forgotten, you, your body, everything you have access to, are the most powerful, most sophisticated, most brilliant, most beautiful technology ever produced by creation. Please don't ever forget that. And please don't let illegitimate ideas, disempowering belief structures seep into your mind because then that'll make it easier for you and your friends to hold that into an actual framework of reality. And then we're going to end up with 2020 all over again. Remember 2020? Whew, that was a doozy. All right. Signing off. I'll catch you guys over at the Deeper Dive. 